The Imago Dei, or the image of God, is probably the most frequently deployed biblical theological concept in our days. That, that's my guess. I have not done any research on, on this, he said shamelessly. It's just a guess, but I think a well-educated one. In pretty much every theological conversation I have participated uh, lately on issues such as race, gender, human dignity, etc., whether in academic uh, context or lay Christian context, someone will readily deploy the theological idea of the Imago Dei right at the outset of that conversation as a fundamental assumption for the discussion. And there are good reasons for that. First, the Imago Dei is the first meaningful theological anthropological statement we find in scripture. It is right there in Genesis, the most elemental statement about human origins. It is the foundation for the entire modern conceptualization of human rights and, and human dignity, even if it's not often acknowledged in, in secular discourse. But also the doctrine is so prominent nowadays because humans and societies, especially Western ones, have never been as obsessed with the issue of identity as in our days. And the doctrine of the Imago Dei has a lot to say about that idea. But as, fascinated as uh, fascinating as the issue of identity is, the doctrine of the Imago Dei has so much more depth and breadth to it, work, male and female cooperation, Sabbath, family, creation, care, suffering, a complex fabric of interwoven realities finds its center point in our essential identity and most importantly, our essential calling as image bearers. Dr. Carmen, Carmen Imes, professor of Old Testament at Talbot School of Theology, brings her expertise in the Pentateuch to reflect on the many facets of this doctrine in her book, Being God's Image, Why Creation Still Matters. I was supposed to be holding the book right now, but it's my bag, so there I'm you go. Prepared. I come prepared. <laughs> Came prepared. Um, she's also the author of uh, Bearing God's Name. There you go. <laughs> Why Sinai Still Matters, and Reading the Psalms with Augustine and Friends. I don't think you have that one. I do. Okay. <laughs> Carmen has a YouTube channel where he, she releases weekly Torah Tuesday videos, very popular, very great material there. And you can find her writings on various websites, including Christianity Today, The Well, and the Politics of Theology blog. She has appeared on over 100 podcasts and radio shows. Um, Car Carmen is passionate about equipping the church to engage the Old Testament well and to see its relevance for the Christian life. And this is important, she's also a Gordon Con Conroe graduate from the Charlotte campus. It's, uh, she said, it's weird to be in your alma mater for the first time. <laughs> She's visiting us for the first time, so show her a good Gordon Connell Hamilton campus hospitality, please. <laughs> Interacting with Dr. Imes, we have our beloved colleague, Dr. Carol Kaminsky, senior professor of Old Testament here at Gordon Conwell. Dr. Kaminsky, yeah, woohoo. Uh, Dr. Kaminsky is renowned as the creator of Casket Empty, a method of Bible study that promotes Bible literacy and comprehension of the Old Testament narrative and its ultimate fulfillment in Jesus Christ. Casket Empty is now available in how many languages? I said multiple, so seven languages. And Dr. Mis Kaminsky travels extensively across the United States and internationally, providing biblical training for various churches and organizations. Among her notable publications are From Noah to Israel, Realization of Primeval Blessing of After the Flood, Was Noah Good? Finding Favor in the Flood Narratives, and most recently, First and Second Chronicles, the story of God, Bible commentary. Rich conversation today happening both here and the podcast. So let's welcome Dr. Carmen Arms. Arms. Thank you. It is a pleasure to be here with all of you. And I, I, we have so much that we could talk about today. Um, October Carmen thought it would be a really good idea to narrow it down to just two areas to dive into. And, and so I chose somewhat arbitrarily sexual identity and uh, artificial intelligence as the two things that we could tease out together. And partly because in the book, I don't do either. And I wanted to give you something that's not already in print. Uh, so, uh, so what you're going to get is not expert commentary on either of these topics, but just what is it, how can we think about if we have we have a solid understanding of what it means to be God's image, what relevance would it have for some of these hot topics today? So seize the Imago Dei, 
From whom? Who are we seizing it from? And who, why do we need to reclaim it? I would argue that the Imago Dei must be reclaimed from certain cultural trends in the West that might be threats to the idea of the Imago Dei. Um, but also, we need to retrieve it or reclaim it from sloppy thinking among evangelicals. Um, there's been a lot of sloppy thinking that, that works its way out into um, policies and values that are not always uh, geared towards human flourishing. So we'll be looking at evangelical doctrine and practice as well. So I'd like to begin by sketching out the state of modern Western thought on human personhood, very briefly, <laughs> especially with reference to these two emerging challenges, the new sexual revolution and the rise of artificial intelligence. These both challenge the biblical concept of the Imago Dei in their own ways, the former by presuming that expressive individualism is the goal and that human identity arises from the self. I decide who I am and I can change my mind about my identity at any time. The latter, artificial intelligence, challenges the biblical concept of the Imago Dei by presuming that humanity is just one stage in our evolving collective consciousness that may well be superseded by computers. So uh, I began my study of this topic as all serious research researchers do. I Googled it. <laughs> and I saw right away that according to psycholo psychology today, identity can be modified. And if, if you dig down into the you know, questions, these are some very commonly asked questions that are posed online that suggest that people are obsessed with the question of how to change their identity. In his 1999 book on postmodernism, David Lyons suggested, the body has become the site of style in postmodern culture. It is plastic, malleable, subject to alteration, mutation, enhancement. In a consumer culture, the body can be molded into any desired appearance from teenage nose and eyebrow rings to the elaborate ornamenting, caring, and modeling of cosmetic chameleons like Michael Jackson. Uh, bodies may be improved as in any other industrial process, either at an early stage using reproductive technologies or later using surgery, hormone treatments, or chemical applications. The body may even take center stage as the real me, as being equivalent to the self. Again. This was 1999, and things have changed rather dramatically since then. The body is no longer considered the real me, but rather an accessory to the true self that may or may not reflect who I really am. The sexual revolution of the 60s and 70s, this was before my time, so I'm relying here on others, emphasized autonomy by removing boundaries around sexual activity. It reconceived of sexual activity by disconnecting it from lifelong commitment, as well as from procreation and turning it into a form of casual recreation without commitment. The rise of birth control and the wider availability of abortion altered the purpose of sex and the possibility of sexual engagement without the responsibilities of parenthood. At the same time, the proliferation of pornography in the West made it possible for individuals to experience sexual arousal and release without any relational interaction at all. Each individual became the arbiter of his or her own sexual behavior. Now this is not to say that sex without consequences was entirely new. As they say, prostitution is as old as the hills and erotic imagery is not unknown in the ancient world. However, attitudes shifted in the 60s and 70s, accelerating public acceptance of sexual liberalism in the West. The sexual revolution of the 2010s and 20s is, takes this to another level by emphasizing not just that I can do whatever I want with whomever I want, whenever I want, but that I can be whatever kind of sexual being I want to be. Each individual is becoming the arbiter of his or her own sexual identity. Sexual identity, uh, just as a primer uh, here to this topic, is a, is a complex concept that involves biological sex, gender identity, social expression of that identity, and sexual orientation, 
And that last category includes the contours of desire or lack thereof. So that's where we get all the letters, LGBTQIA+. No longer is birth sex the determining factor in how someone chooses to identify, and no longer are there only two options, male and female. The gender binary has been set aside in favor of a spectrum of possibilities combining the factors in these four categories with nearly infinite variation. The growing lack of congruence between genitalia and gender expression has naturally given birth to a range of behavioral, cosmetic, and dress modifications that now include hormone therapy, hormone blockers, and surgical procedures, all designed to empower people to remake themselves according to their own image. A friend of ours told me about her daughter's classroom uh, at a public junior high school. The school prided itself on being a welcoming place for everyone of any gender or sexual orientation. So the teacher led a classroom exercise in which the children introduced themselves to their classmates. Hi, I'm Carmen. I identify as a white, cisgender, heterosexual, able-bodied woman. My, pronoun my pronouns are she and her. Since her students' self-designations could change at will at any time, the teacher led this exercise monthly, offering space for students to remake their identities over and over all year long and encouraging experimentation. Is it any wonder that no one in the class identified their, their gender with their birth sex by the end of the year? Like they all had different designations. If identity is self-determined and infinitely malleable, then this kind of exercise makes perfect sense. In fact, it's necessary. To be clear, this may be already patently obvious, sexual identity and expression are not the focus of my research, but this brief summary of current trends is intended to pique our curiosity about how the doctrine of the Imago Dei might inform our response. Before we do so, let's consider another trend that's rapidly changing our world, and that is artificial intelligence. According to IBM, or I'm just trusting the experts here, artificial intelligence, or AI, is technology that enables computers and machines to simulate human intelligence and problem-solving capabilities on its own or combined with other technologies, example, sensors, geolocation, or ro robotics, AI can perform tasks that would otherwise require human intelligence or intervention. How many of you have knowingly pursued and used AI? You've tried ChatGPT or something, okay? So not all of us yet, We're, we have some holdouts in the room. <laughs> As a field of computer science, artificial intelligence encompasses and is often mentioned together with machine learning and deep learning. These disciplines involve the development of AI algorithms modeled after the decision-making processes of the human brain that can learn from available data and make increasingly more accurate classifications of predict predictions over time. You can tell ChatGPT that is incorrect, and they'll say, oh, I'm sorry, let me try again. <laughs> Artificial intelligence has gone through many cycles of hype according to IBM, but even to skeptics, the release of ChatGPT seems to mark a turning point. The last time generative AI loomed this large, the breakthroughs were in computer vision, but now the leap forward is in natural language processing. Today, generative AI can learn and synthesize not just human language, but other data types, including images, video, software code, and even molecular structures. And so, of course, if you're on social media, you're seeing AI-generated images that people, you know, I asked, I asked uh, ChatGPT to give me such, such and such an image, and here's what they think Moses looked like or whatever. It's, it's entertaining. So ChatGPT has been around for less than 18 months, but it is the fastest growing consumer application to date with over 100 million users in its first two months. So the holdouts in the room are, were just the Luddites uh, here. It's no use boycotting AI. We use it every time we do a Google search, map directions on our phone, 
uh, dictate a te text or email, you know, voice to text, or chat with an online service representative. Like it or not, AI is a part of life going forward, but it raises important questions about what it means to be human. Aside from ethical questions around plagiarism and dissemination of misinformation, we might wonder, have humans been replaced by machines? Or will we be in the near future? But current tre cultural trends in the West, such as the sexual revolution or the rise of artificial intelligence, are not the only threat to the Imago Dei. Evangelical teaching frequently distorts what the Bible says about the Imago Dei with significant impacts on our practice. We've inherited a long history of theological speculation on the Imago Dei, along with some ways of construing it that are patently unhelpful, I would argue. If we want to experience true human flourishing, then it's essential that we reclaim the biblical vision of human personhood. My contention, which I hope is not controversial, is that if we want to understand human personhood, in relation to either of these hot topics, the sexual revolution and the rise of artificial intelligence, we must begin with the creation accounts in Genesis. They have so much to teach us about what it means to be human, and they will offer clarity on human uniqueness and identity formation. So let's start at the very beginning. Traditional teaching on the image of God usually revolves around the question of what makes humans different from the rest of creation. Interpreters often consider what capacity humans have that sets us apart from animals. Is it our rationality, our self-consciousness, our relationality, our moral compass? Now, I don't mean to suggest that there's no difference between humans and animals. Our intuition tells us there's a difference. The Bible is absolutely and repeatedly clear that humans are the crown of creation. But our one problem with attaching the Imago Dei to human capacity is its thin exegetical basis. Genesis simply doesn't specify which capabilities set us apart from animals, if any. Focusing on human capability also carries some unintended negative consequences for those on the margins, as well as in the face of technological developments today. What about humans who are less rational or less relational or less self-conscious, whether from birth or as a result of injury or disease? And what happens when computers exceed our human capabilities for computation, problem solving, synthesizing information, and expressing it intelligently? Is there another way to conceive of the Imago Dei? I think there is. Traditional evangelical theology on the Imago Dei has often failed to ad adequately consider these three areas, the ancient Near Eastern context, the literary context, and the theological context. So I'd like to highlight the work of five evangelical scholars, recent work, that address these deficiencies and summarize their key points. So we're gonna have a little, this is like a poster presentation of all the cool people I've learned from and what they're saying. So I will focus my comments on the work of Ryan Peterson, Richard Middleton, uh, Gordon Conwell's own Catherine McDowell, uh, John Kilner, and Krista McCurland. Ryan Peterson is a colleague of mine at Talbot School of Theology. He's an evangelical theologian who wrote his Wheaton dissertation on the image of God. He examined traditional explanations of the Imago Dei and found them wanting. Building on the exegetical work of Old Testament scholars, this is a conversation that hasn't happened often enough in history, theologians talking to Bible scholars and vice versa, which is what I appreciate about his work. Peterson concluded that the Imago Dei is not a capacity we possess or a function we fulfill, but rather it's our human identity. It's who we are. This makes it especially pertinent to our question today about sexual identity. Peterson employs, quote, a strong corporate conception of identity, which implies that the Imago Dei is a common identity shared by all individual human beings. Human identity refers to that which uniquely identifies humanity as the particular creature that it is, defined by its relation to God. This identity is real whether or not an individual human being knows her identity, since human identity is determined by the transcendent God who makes each creature and all of creation what it ultimately is. So our identity as God's image should lift our gaze to God since he's the one who defines and determines this identity. 
Genesis 1, 26 to 27 reads, Then God said, Let us make humankind as our image, as our likeness. So God created humankind as his own image. As the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. The Hebrew word selam, usually translated image, is not something amorphous or spiritual in nature. It's not intangible. A selam is quite concrete. Selam, or its cognate salmu in, a, in Akkadian, denotes an idol or statue, a physical representation of a king or a deity. Attention to the ancient Near Eastern context makes this clear. A king who conquered a vast territory could not be physically present everywhere, so he would set up images of himself at the center and at the far reaches of his kingdom. These statues were not the king, but they represented the king, serving as a reminder of his rule and mediating his presence. This particular statue is Hadad Yith'i, the king of Gusan, an ancient kingdom on the boundary between modern-day Turkey and Syria. The inscription on his statue, this is a very large statue, and so his skirt is inscribed in cuneiform, and you can't read it because of the lighting, but um, if you could read it, it would say, um, in both Aramaic and Akkadian, it's a bilingual skirt, uh, it, it refers to the statue. <laughs> Anybody else have a bilingual skirt? I don't have one. <laughs> I want to know where, where we can get these. Um, it refers to the statue as both a tselem or tsalmu and a demuth, which is the word for likeness. The same two words we find in Genesis 126 to describe humanity. So this is handy because in so many cases when the Old Testament uses a word, there's no glossary right there. And there's no like, it's not like we have an illustrated Hebrew Bible that draws it for us. But here we have a statue using both words to tell us what an image is. Similarly, ancient Near Eastern temples contained an image or images of the god or gods to whom they were dedicated. In elaborate ceremonies, the idols were ritually consecrated to make present the deity in that location. For humans to be God's image indicates that we physically and three-dimensionally represent God's presence on earth. An image is what we are. It's our human identity. Richard Middleton, our second evangelical voice here, suggests that the entire complex narrative of Genesis 1 to 11 is written as a polemic against Mesopotamian ideology, calling it, quote, one of the most daring acts of theological imagination within scripture, end quote. Genesis 1 presents the cosmos as a temple and humanity as the image in that temple. Middleton notes that our identity as God's image has implications for our actions, namely that we express it by ruling creation on God's behalf. Rulership is just one of many functions implied by our status, but Middleton, like Peterson, is careful not to say that the function is, is the image. The function is an implication of the image, and we'll see why that's important in a moment. Returning to our key text, notice that the announcement of God's image is followed by its implications. So that they may rule over the fish in the sea and the birds in the sky, over the livestock and all the wild animals, and over all the creatures that move along the ground. So God creates humankind uh, as his own image. And then he tells, tells us, be fruitful and increase in number, fill the earth and subdue it. Rule over the fish in the sea and the birds in the sky and over every living creature that moves on the ground. So in Middleton's words, the Imago Dei designates the royal office or calling of human beings as God's representatives and agents in the world, granted authorized power to share in God's rule or administration of the earth's resources and creatures. The words for rule and subdue imply that the image is to exercise power, and rule connotes kingship. Benevolent stewardship of creation is an essential implication, then, of our status as God's image. It's not an exploitative kind of rulership or leadership. It's benevolent. We mimic God's creative activity by cultivating and naming creation, by maintaining order that provides for its flourishing. To be clear, the communal exercise of power prescribed here is not the essence of being God's image, but is an implication or entailment of human identity. 
whether or not we function in this capacity, we are God's image. Most scholars locate the discussions of the Imago Dei in Genesis 1, but Catherine McDowell is convinced that the image of God is also the focus of Genesis 2. McDowell is professor of Old Testament here at Gordon-Conwell, and well, here at the institution, but there in Charlotte. And in her Harvard dissertation, she considers the ancient Near Eastern context of Genesis 2, comparing it with the Babylonian Miss P. Pit P. ritual, uh, also known as the opening of the mouth, which was used to inaugurate a new consecrated cult statue or image. Similarities between this ritual and Genesis 2 account of humanity in the garden include the setting in a garden temple, the animation of the senses, the installation of the image in sacred space, the feeding of it, and the opening of its eyes. The cumulative effect of these similarities between Genesis 2 and the Babylonian rituals suggests the ritual birth of humanity as God's image. That is, Genesis 2 presents the first human in a way analogous to a cult statue. From this, McDowell draws several conclusions about the nature of the Imago Dei, but I'll just highlight two. Along with Middleton, McDowell emphasizes our role as rulers. Central to her argument are expositions of the first human's mandate to fill, subdue, and rule over the earth in Genesis 1, as well as human responsibility to exercise law and justice in Genesis 9 following the flood. As beings made according to God's image, humans are, quote, designed to manifest his presence in the world. Second, McDowell argues that the Bible's portrait of human identity presents us as God's kin, God's family. She pays close attention to Genesis 5, where Adam's son Seth is said to be according to his likeness. Seth's likeness to Adam is placed alongside Adam's likeness to Yahweh, offering an analogy that helps to define image as kinship. We are God's family. That's our identity. We are God's image like Seth is Adam's image. Our fourth evangelical conversation partner is John Kilner. I heard John Kilner speak at my very first ETS annual meeting in 2009 in New Orleans. The strength of his argument was convincing, and if you're interested, you can read his paper in Jets or dive into his full-length monograph on the topic, which is entitled Dignity and Destiny. Kilner is a theologian and ethicist who teaches at Trinity Evangelical Divinity School. His argument in that plenary session was simple, but I found it surprising. He said the image of God was not distorted or diminished or destroyed at the fall. It is commonplace for theologians and pastors to talk as though the fall ruined everything, as though some essential component of what it means to be human was lost when Adam and Eve sinned. However, the text says nothing of the sort. Some point to Genesis 5 to justify this reading. Although Adam was made in God's likeness, Adam's son was made in Adam's likeness, so the divine imprint has been replaced. However, it doesn't work to see this as a diminishment of the Imago Dei because in Genesis 9, 6, after the flood, God instructs people to honor the sanctity of human life by not murdering fellow humans because humans are God's image. Post-fall and even post-flood, the image is apparently intact. For Kilner, much is at stake in this claim that every human being is still the image of God. Without it, we lose our grounds for proper treatment of our fellow humans, a la Genesis 9. If the Imago Dei is rooted in a capacity, such as rationality or relationality or self-consciousness, what happens when someone is in a coma? What happens if someone is born with a disability? Are they not fully the image of God? Kilner insists, along with P Peterson and Middleton, that image cannot be defined by attributes that people have, such as reason or rule or righteousness or relationality. God bestows dignity on human beings that does not depend on our abilities and is not lost mm -hmm. due to sin. So back to Peterson, he explains that because of our identity as God's image, it follows that we are most fully ourselves when we imitate God. Since we are God's image, we naturally take on the characteristics of the one we worship. 
This is one reason it is crucial that we do not worship idols. We are God's image. So the worship of idols not only dethrones God, but it also unseats us from our God-given status as his royal representatives. Peterson explains that, quote, humanity retains its created status as the creature made in the image and likeness of God. However, after the fall, humanity practices a form of life that amounts to a lie about the creator. That is, humanity continues in its vocation as God's image, but fails to image God in truthful ways. He says, because of our sin, humans misrepresent God to creation. So perhaps an illustration will help. Imagine you have a son with whom you have a falling out. Your son no longer calls or comes to visit you. Your relationship may be broken or strained, but his status as your son is unchanged. There is simply no way to erase the biological connection between parent and child. You will always be his parent and he will always be your son. The same is true with the Imago Dei. Every human being is God's image. As we learned from Catherine McDowell, that status implies kinship or is at least analogous to kinship. We are God's family. Many humans are estranged from their creator and do not live in light of their true identity as God's children. However, their family status, status is unchanged. In Kilner's words, quote, Christ constitutes a complete picture of what God intends for people in God's image to be and do. So I should add here that evangelicals disagree over whether every human being is the image of God. Of the four scholars I've surveyed so far, Peterson and Middleton insist that humans are the image of God, and Kilner and McDowell assert that only Jesus is the image of God. The rest of us are made in the image of God. The answer seems to ride in part on how you interpret the preposition bait in Genesis 126. But selim is how it, it, it's attached to the word selim. Is it a bait of identity? Or is it a preposition that indicates distance? In terms of practice, um, we all agree on ethical treatment of other people. So I don't see any um, huge difference. All of us agree that our human identity is grounded in this affirmation and that our ethics rely on viewing every human being in this light. We also agree that Jesus is the human par excellence who models for us how God intends for us to live as humans. However, my working hypothesis is that to talk about being God's image rather than being made in God's image reinforces the concept that the Imago Dei is our human identity rather than a capacity that can be lost. This is also why you won't hear me talking about bearing God's image, because if, you bear, if you're bearing something, you can set it down. But there isn't anything we can do to lose our identity as, as the image of God. So before we move on, I want to introduce a final conversation partner, analytical theologian Krista McCurland. McCurland is a lecturer in systematic theology at Cary Baptist College in New Zealand, and in her published dissertation, God's Provision, Humanity's Need, the Gift of Our Dependence, McCurland notes, along with the others mentioned, that, quote, being in the image of God, she uses in, I'm forgiving her for that, <laughs> being in the image of God supplies the identity of human persons with attendant functions, such as dominion. But she clarifies, these functions do not constitute the image of God, so still they are expressions of this identity. McCurland also points to the concreteness or materiality of human embodiment rather than human capacities or functions as the ground for the image of God. Anyone with a human body is the image of God. And I'm looking out across the room and it, it appears to me that you all remembered your bodies today, which is good. The Imago Dei, according to Krista McCurland, is not degreed. That is, there are not higher degrees of being God's image, but our flourishing is degreed. And, and this might help us explain what happened in Genesis 3. McCurland points to an unsettling truth, that is, a tendency in Western thinking is to strive for self-sufficiency and absolute autonomy. Well, in her words, such striving undermines true flourishing. 
We learn from Christ what some of the parameters are of our human need, including our need for the presence of God. She concludes, humankind is intended to experience dynamic flourishing in and through personal communion with the very triune life of God. To put it another way, flourishing is itself constituted by union with God. It is this which was diminished at the fall. Not our status or identity as God's image, but our capacity to flourish because of our separation from the life of God. So let's pause a moment and take stock of these insights. What have we've covered a quite a bit of ground here. Number one, the Imago Dei is not a capacity, but is our human identity. Every human being is God's image. Being God's image implies we are God's family. Our status as God's image cannot be lost or destroyed, but our capacity to flourish is dependent upon union with God. Being God's image has implications for our vocation. We are to rule over creation on God's behalf as stewards of its flourishing. And finally, every because every good list of theological points have, consists of seven, Every human being, by virtue of our status as God's image, possesses dignity and should be treated accordingly. All right, so Genesis 9 confirms that the Imago Dei was not lost in Genesis 3, and the fall of Adam and Eve was not the fall of the Imago Dei. It was rather a breach of trust, resulting in a fam family crisis. This is a, world, a message our world desperately needs. So let's talk about the path toward human flourishing. The world defines human flourishing quite narrowly in terms of happiness, autonomy, and productivity. Anyone who is not happy or unproductive or unable to live independently has a life not worth living. The Bible offers a much wider vision of human flourishing that makes space for all humans in our diversity of race, gender, age, and ability values that the church is often slow in adopting. Productivity is not the measure of flourishing, neither is health or wealth. To flourish is to understand our God-given value, to experience union with God, and to participate in collaborative independent, interdependence with other humans. Construed this way, even our suffering and our need can bring us together and provide opportunities for mutual encouragement, uh, mutual recognition of our worth. Happiness is not a prerequisite for a meaningful life. So as for the threat of artificial intelligence, as soon as we clarify that the Imago Dei does not depend upon human intelligence or rationality, we diffuse some of the angst. So what? The computer's faster than I am. My identity or status as the image of God doesn't depend on me being the fastest. Um, we are not the image of God because of our unique skills, but because God in God's wisdom has determined to call us his image and appoint us to this role. We need not prove ourselves worthy of this appointment. We cannot be eclipsed by a machine. The temptation of plagiarism is one example where the idolatry of independence and productivity is a vicious cycle. Pushing students to cheat in order to stand out so they can maintain the illusion of adding value by saying something brilliant. However, if our value is already settled, then plagiarism adds nothing. It remains to be seen how the rise of artificial intelligence will change the landscape of human interaction, education, and career development. Because AI is dependent upon the digital data that we feed it in the first place, the outcomes will reflect human values. Actually, somebody uh, a year ago tried a, a, an AI tool and said, what is Carmen Imes' view on the image of God? And then he sent to me what it spit out. It wasn't you, Mike, was it? Okay. Um, it, I think it was somebody in the, in the group who tried this out, and, and it was terrible. It was terrible. It was precisely what I don't think. And the reason for that is because the data set that AI was drawing on to answer that question closed before my book came out and before I had done any public interviews or podcasts or whatever about it. So the world out there didn't know. The, the, the internet didn't know yet what Carmen Imes thought about the image of God. What, 
What happened instead was they took a bunch of phrases about image of God and threw them in a blender, and it came out that I think it's about rationality and, you know, whatever. Like, that's not what I think. So, um, so all that to say, it, 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 the output depends on what input, the quality of the input we give it. My first feeling when I, when I heard about artificial intelligence was becoming, you know, chat GPT was happening and all this, it's like, I better get busy writing because we've got to write a lot of good stuff to overcome the volume of really bad stuff that's out there so that AI will actually say things that are worth saying. That was my thought. Um, the outcomes, again, reflect human values and what we put into it. So this is a frightening prospect in a world where racism, sexism, and ableism are still rampant. Computers are gonna mimic that if that's what we put in. Even the ethical parameters that engineers are developing for AI depend upon the values those engineers bring to the project. So here's my shout out for Christian liberal arts education because we need to develop engineers with strong set of values. Our unique human task is to carry on with the work of creativity, naming, and bringing order to the good world God made. We retain authority over technology because God gave it to us. We set the parameters of its use and misuse. We create new pathways and opportunities. At its best, AI can aid us in our work as a kind of co-pilot. But if we hand over the wheel, we miss out on the joy of creative participation. As co-collaborators with other humans, we can work to underscore human dignity and value, finding ways to invite others into meaningful work and worship. The conversation around transgender identities is perhaps the one with the most at stake in our cultural moment. The experience of gender dysphoria, that is a perceived mismatch between birth sex and gender identity, can be highly distressing. Even just two decades ago, therapists sought to help people change their thinking to match their bodies, helping them to feel comfortable in their own skin. And now, as we've said, many therapists and doctors approach the issue the other way around, recommending that patients surgically or otherwise reshape the body to match the gender identity that feels most normal or natural. Children are encouraged to pursue hormone therapies and even surgery to permanently alter their bodies so that they align with their emerging sense of self. All this before puberty and before most of them can even understand sexual attraction and identity. Current practice ignores developmental psychology and is creating a crisis that does not result in better mental health outcomes for our children. The biblical doctrine of the Imago Dei suggests that our truest selves are given rather than self-determined and that our sexed embodiment matters for the vocation that God has given us to do. Our bodies in all our diversity are not simply a disposable shell around our true selves, but are instead the site of God's interaction with us and of our interaction with one another by which and through which we fulfill our human purpose in the world. This is not to say that Genesis 1 and 2 combats gender, transgender identity directly. This question was not on the radar of the biblical writers, and I don't want to distort Genesis by pretending it addresses this question directly. At the same time, the principles espoused in scripture do offer guidance for the larger questions that arise in relation to human identity and vocation. Our bodies matter. God created them and pronounced them very good. Our bodies are the only qualification for our status as God's image. We can consider a whole range of bodily modifications and ask whether they're appropriate. A facelift, a nose job, false teeth, a hysterectomy or an, a vasectomy, a knee replacement, a skin grafting for a burn, a tattoo or a piercing. Are bodily modifications appropriate to the degree that they reinforce or restore our God-given embodiment and inappropriate to the degree that they reject our givenness? Then what about disability? And what about non-permanent or non-surgical bodily modifications such as a chest wrap or hormone blocker or simply cross-dressing? Is there a line? And if so, where is it? 
I can't say definitively if there is a line to bodily modification or where it is, but I can say this with confidence. Transgender persons are the image of God. Their bodies signal their humanity and therefore their inherent dignity. As humans, they are part of God's royal family, part of our royal family. Surgical intervention does not and cannot change this. Perhaps the best and most important way that we can reclaim the doctrine of the Imago Dei for transgender people is to treat them with dignity as beloved fellow collaborators in the quest for the flourishing of all creation. Given our human need for a relationship with God, if at all possible, let us be ministers of reconciliation. Transgender people and other sexual minorities often feel there's no place for them in the church, even if they hold to traditional sexual morals. We have focused so much on the nuclear family that some of us have lost our vision for the church as an intergenerational family of faith that includes singles. We've forgotten our own history, which venerated virgins and those dedicated to celibacy as models of virtue. That this collective amnesia coincides with the rapid rise of LGBTQIA identifying Christians represents a faith and belonging crisis that we have only begun to witness. As John Calvin argued in his Institutes of the Christian Religion, the quest for self-knowledge will only be realized as we seek God. He said, it is certain that man never achieves a clear knowledge of himself unless he has first looked upon God's face and then de descends from contemplating him to scrutinize himself. In his French edition, the connection's even clearer. In knowing God, each of us also knows himself. I hope you'll agree that it's time for evangelicals to seize the Imago Dei reclaiming its power for ethics and for cultivating communities of meaningful collaboration and belonging. We have a lot to recover. I'm putting up here a QR code as I take my seat. Um, IVP is generously offering 40% off if you want to order anything in their catalog, not just my books. So um, don't let that distract you from what Dr. Kaminsky is about to share. Great to be here. Well, thank you, uh, Dr. Imes, for such a thought-provoking paper and on a critical topic for the church. And what I really appreciate is that you've not only looked at a biblical concept, but you've also tried to grapple with these contemporary issues. Uh, so I think there's, that's wonderful. Uh, there is a lot at stake and I have a limited amount of time, so I'm going to jump right in. I'm going to make a few comments about ancient Near Eastern context and its implications for the image of God. Uh, but my primary focus will be on actually the issue of the Imago Dei and the role of the fall, and especially thinking about the creation account. And then I'll also look at some of its literary context because I think this is ultimately critical for our understanding of human identity for flourishing and also the implications for the church. So first of all, ancient Near Eastern, uh, we share a common love for the ancient Near Eastern context uh, with Dr. McDowell as well. I was first introduced this with David Klein's article, 1968, uh, The Image of God in Man, and of course, uh, Dr. McDowell's recent work, which is wonderful. So a couple of uh, three points of response in terms of the ancient Near Eastern context. Um, I think my first point to note is that I, um, I don't think the Imago Dei is only a body or that that's the primary focus. I do agree that there's a three-dimensional representation, uh, so I do affirm that it's concrete, and I do affirm the importance of the body, which is Tim Tennant's work, but I also think it is spiritual. In the ancient Near Eastern context, the molded clay or the carved statue is not an image without the animation ritual where it becomes the physical manifestation or the presence of the deity. And as you mentioned, Dr. McDowell's work on the opening of the mouth ritual, it is at this point that the, the object becomes, is brought to life. And I think this is the whole point of Dr. McDowell's work on ancient Near Eastern and Genesis chapter two, 
is that humanity becomes God's image, not only as the physical representation, but when God breathes into Adam the breath of life, then he becomes the living image. And I think this therefore sets up a unique relationship between Adam, humanity, and God. And we could also think of the let us in Genesis 1, the antecedent being Elohim and Ruach. Uh, second point, in terms of the relational aspect of the image. Uh, you state that relationality is not intrinsic to what it means to be made in God's image. And I think the Old Testament and ancient Near Eastern context can help us here. Uh, so when we think about the Old Testament idols uh, elsewhere, the term selem, we know that the idols have eyes but they cannot see and they have ears but they cannot hear and there's the mouth they cannot speak. So there's no breath in them. But Genesis 1 and 2 is a polemic against idolatry and against the fact that these images are dumb images but God creates living images who I would argue are created for a living relationship with him. So I think therefore this gives us a capacity for relationship. It, it is what sets us apart from the animals, living creatures, but also what sets us apart from the cult statutes. We have a capacity for relationship with fellow human beings, male and female, and with God. And then McDowell makes this interesting observation. As you noted, she says that the cult statute is put within the temple and which corresponds to the installation of Adam in the sacred garden. But then there's a difference. And I think this is profound. It is that God walks with his living images in the garden. It is not that he has placed them to represent him where he is not present. But I think the whole book is worth that very concept. <laughs> because like a king's statue where he's not present, God is with them, talking with them as his living images, and he walks with them in the garden. We could think about people like Enoch and Noah and uh, Abraham who walk with God, but we could also think of God walking in the tabernacle in the presence of the, the priest. So I think that underscores the living aspect and also the relational aspect of it. Human identity and flourishing, therefore, are directly related to our relationship with God. Life is found in God's presence, in proximity to him, imaging him in terms of his glory, reflecting him like Moses when he's on the mountain with God, that there is a reflection that happens on his face or the shining of the rays, 2 Corinthians chapter 3 and Hebrews chapter 1. Uh, the next point I want to um, highlight is I do think there is an ethical quality to what it means to be the image of God. Uh, we are to represent and reflect God, and you noted ruling as his vice regents, vice regents, but Genesis chapter 3 also identifies the fact that ruling is in submission to him. So we have a command that is being given, and so it is in relationship with God, but it's also in obedience with him. And when we think of the concept of ruling, we could think of the throne being right uh, of righteousness and justice, uh, Jeremiah 22. So I think there's an ethical quality to what it means to rule over the kingdom. And we could look at Demut as well uh, in terms of the likeness and representing his character. So, but what we find in the story is that God creates human beings in his image, or to be his image, uh, but we also see disobedience and a movement away from the face of God or the presence of God, and the question is, how does that impact the Imago Dei? So, this is now leading to the next topic, uh, the image of God and the fall. I agree that the image of God gives every human being intrinsic value and dignity, and I think you are right in emphasising that and calling us back to that. But then when you talk about the fall and you describe the fall as some essential component of what it means to be human that was lost when Adam and Eve sinned, and then you argue that Genesis doesn't say anything about that that also have implications in terms of seeing every human being as part of God's royal family. I'm going to come back to that as well in a few moments. 
And I think probably here's where we differ significantly. So my view of human identity and flourishing is not only shaped by ancient Near Eastern context and by Genesis chapters 1 and 2, but also by Genesis chapter 3. What does it mean to be human, the fall and its impact on the theology of the Imago Dei and practice? So I don't think we should be reading Genesis 1 and 2 in isolation, but looking at it within the context of Genesis, not only the immediate but the larger book. One example of reading and interpreting Selim within the canon itself, and then I'm going to look at Genesis. So when we look at the term Selim in the canon itself, we notice that idols are always portrayed negatively. The creation and worship of images, right, it, that you see throughout the story of the Old Testament creates this distortion of the divine human relationship. But I want to suggest that this also impacts the Imago Dei. Because what we find in the book of Isaiah is an example, but elsewhere, is that worshipping of idols leads to the malfunctioning of the human being. Right? So if essential to being a human being is the giving of the life and becoming a living person, what you find in idolatry is a malfunctioning of the senses so that humans, instead of imaging God, start to image the idols that they're made and they become dumb and deaf like their idols. Um, so there is therefore through idolatry, the human sensory organs are being deactivated. What does that have to do with the Imago Dei? Uh, Dr. Medal's forthcoming article, What Isaiah Knew, The Lord is God and There is No Other. So I simply want to raise the question, what is the malfunctioning of Israel in response to idols how does that impact the Imago Dei? I also want to mention a book by uh, Rick Lintz called Identity and Idolatry. This one, The Image of God and Its Inversion. So, and we have a theologian, which is a good thing too. He notes that theology has wrongly focused on the image of God expression, which is very limited, to define what it means to be human. He argues that the context of idolatry has something to say about the Imago Dei. And he argues that there's an inversion as a result of the fall that humans worship the creature instead of the creature, creator. And then he makes the observation that within the canon itself, Genesis 1 and 2 starts with image of God language and that language disappears from the canon and what dominates is idolatry, tell him. So he says this is the inversion, but then when the restoration happens, image of God language starts to turn up with Jesus, who not only is going to restore the image, but uh, he defeats um, humans idolatry he then enables them not to worship idols and so he starts to see this uh, uh, argument therefore that this section in between which I would argue starts at Genesis 3 Genesis 3 Romans 1 is this distortion that takes place that does impact the Imago Dei uh, so what about Genesis so Genesis, I just want to highlight a couple of things here. And first of all, uh, Genesis 1 and 2, I think, needs to be interpreted in light of Genesis chapter 3 to 50. We don't want to make the mistake just because the word selim is not used, that the concept of human identity is not found. That was Kathy's point, Dr. McDowell's point. Selim is not used in chapter 2, but the concept is there. So the first question we want to ask is, is there any concept of Tselem in chapter 3, and what you find is language like, like God, opening of the eyes, nakedness in the body, relational changes between male and female, and so forth. So there is potentially important information about the Imago Dei there. But in a bigger scale, now think of the book of Genesis. We're thinking about human identity. What happens? We have, and I'm just going to run through this really quickly, murder, polygamy, 
violence, corruption, wickedness, nakedness, Sodom and Gomorrah, men wanting to have sexual relations with other men, Lot, his two daughters, get him drunk so that they can have sex with him. Reuben sleeps with his father's concubine. Judah has sex with his daughter-in-law, thinking she's a prostitute. Leah pays Rachel mandrakes so she can have sex with Jacob. Shechem rakes Dinah. I mean, so the question for us is, surely this is making a statement about human identity. And in fact, I would argue it's a commentary on human identity and it is underscoring what has gone wrong. To assume that nothing has changed with regard to the Imago Day in Genesis 3 onwards fails to interpret Genesis 1 and 2 within the context of the book of Genesis. I think the fall is more than a breach of trust that leads to a family crisis, but an outright rebellion against God. It affects everything, the cosmos. Humans no longer represent God and reflect him. Okay, uh, on a more positive note, I think Genesis has something to say about the restoration of the Imago Dei. The image of God language, as you note, is used in Genesis chapters 1, 5, and 9. I agree that after the fall, there is a reaffirmation of the Imago Dei. So I agree with you there. But I just want to highlight chapter 5 for a moment uh, because chapter 5 in, uh, is the linear genealogy of Seth. The genealogy of Seth, at the beginning of that, we have a repetition of the creation blessing. We have, going back to Genesis chapter 1, we have naming, and then we have image of God. So I want to ask the question, why is it the Imago Dei language is used in Genesis chapter 5? Why not in chapter 4 when he had Cain? Why is it in chapter 5? For those who know me, I love genealogies. And theology is communicated in genealogies. When I worked on my dissertation, The Creation Blessing, I argued that the creation blessing is being taken up in the line of Seth and Shem that leads to Abraham and ultimately is going to be first fulfilled through Israel. So that the commands be fruitful and multiply, you see the first stage of fulfillment in Exodus 1 verse 7. I want to suggest that the image of God language and sonship is also being particularized in chapter 5. What do I mean by that? So when it comes to the creation blessing, we have the universal multiplication. Genesis chapter 4, Genesis chapter 10. But Genesis communicates a particular realization of the creation blessing through Israel. It is what Borkham talks about we have both the individual and we have the corporate and this particular is for the sake of the universal. So what I want to suggest is perhaps the reiteration of the image language in chapter 5 is signalling that sonship is going to be taken up in chapter 5 going from Seth to Noah and leading to Israel. You make the comment about, and I know I'm, I've got my dean here who's going to keep me on time, but you make the comment as a, a mother, and I'm a mother with sons too, that they're always going to be your sons. And the thing is, I don't think Genesis works that way because what you are starting to see in Genesis is a narrowing down of sonship so that he has both Ishmael and Isaac, but I think Isaac is the promised son, and it's not simply biology, but it's promise. So what you also find then is Reuben, who is the firstborn, loses his preeminence, Genesis chapter 49. And so when we look at the vocabulary of sonship, we start to find that Genesis 5 and 11 is leading to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and sonship language turns up with Israel, not with all humanity. When you look at uh, Exodus chapter 4, it is Israel as the son, not all humanity. You look at Deuteronomy chapter 32, when he mentions the nations, but then he says, Israel, my sons and daughters, 
And of course, we could keep on going with that when we look all the way and trace the theme of sonship, picking up Jesus and the Davidic king and then Jesus. So I think there's a narrowing of sonship and I think therefore a narrowing of the image of God. And just a couple of implications. Number one, we are right to affirm the dignity and worth of every human being, including those unborn, God's unique creation. LGBTQIA and transgender people have dignity and value made in God's image. You're right to emphasise that. But I do not agree that every person is part of God's family. I think this is restricted to people of faith. So number two, uh, you state that Genesis 1 and 2 doesn't necessarily have anything to say with transgender identity, and, of course, it wasn't on the radar, and I agree with you, for the original writers. But I do think it does have something to say about transgender identity and implications for the body. Biological sex, male and female, is given by the creator, and as we've said, the body matters. So I do think their line can be drawn between a knee replacement or a shoulder replacement for the proper functioning of the body in contrast to the removal of sexual organs out of a desire to change one's gender. So I think a line can be drawn and ought to be drawn. We want bodily modifications to be in line with the created order of male and female rather than remove and change the created distinctions. And all of those are included with the chest binders, puberty blockers and so forth. You state that transgender sexual minorities often feel there's no place for them in the church and we need to be a place of welcoming and valuing people. But I think there's another question there. What does it mean for LGBTQI identifying Christians who represent a faith belonging crisis? What does that mean? How do we identify um, those within this uh, group? I'm out of time. 1 Corinthians chapter 4, uh, we do not lose hope, and I'll let you read that. <laughs> this is the stuff of conferences, uh, and we're trying to do this in one James <laughs> forum. So I'm very glad that we're going to continue this conversation later on. But I want to give uh, Carmen a chance to respond yeah. to uh, Carol. And um, I think we might have uh, time for one or two questions, and then we'll have uh, hopefully a, a more, more time for questions at the podcast as well. Although this, there's so much to unpack <laughs> here. So, um, Carmen. I, I'm intrigued um, by the way, I, thank you for your pushback. <laughs> thank you for your uh, affirmation as well. I'm intrigued by you saying that the image of God is being narrowed to the covenant people. So now I'm really curious how you how you would square that with Genesis 9, yeah. because it doesn't seem like God's restricting murder to just don't murder fellow yeah. members of the line of Seth. Yeah. So how and, would and you, I promise, yeah. Dean DeCampos, I'll be very quick. So, so I think what you're starting to see in Genesis is the universal. Mm -hmm. So when I say the creation blessing be fruitful and multiply is being filled particularly in Israel, that doesn't mean others aren't multiplying. Yeah. So I would, and then I think the same thing happens with sons, right? So with Isaac and Ishmael, the text says that Ishmael is his son. So, that, so that you're not denying that, but then he also says, um, offer up your only son. Mm -hmm. Well, what do you mean only son? Right. So I think there's a linear, mm -hmm. so therefore with the image, I would argue that there is a corporate dimension to the image of God that continues, mm -hmm. but the particular fulfillment of that, mm -hmm. and in both cases with mm -hmm. the creation blessing, is that that's actually not the fulfillment of it. It's mm -hmm. still multiplying, but there's some other greater mm -hmm. reality mm -hmm. that's mm -hmm. taking place. Okay. Yeah, yeah I would definitely say... Um, I, I agree with you that the Imago Dei has a spiritual component, and I appreciate you bringing that out more fully than what I did. I don't want to say we're only bodies, right. um, but that animation in the garden, it does matter, and I could, I could do more with that. Um, we are re relational and have that relational capability with God and with one another, and I, 
That's what I love about Krista McCurlin's work is her kind of being able to name that we have this fundamental need for dependence on God and on each other, and that's, that's the key to our flourishing. And let me just say, I do think Genesis 3 is very bad, and I think that the rebellion of humanity is serious and that it has serious, ongoing, disastrous consequences. Um, what, I'm, what I'm questioning or, or trying to overturn is the idea that it, that it somehow undoes this human status as God's image or human identity. Um, what it's doing is, is, I think, not that. I do see a narrowing of God's purposes to Israel, and then through Israel, all nations will be blessed. So I see the sonship narrowing, but I'm not sure that son, that sonship needs to equal the, the royal family language. I think there might be multiple layers of the same metaphors being used. Um, and I suppose that's where yeah. I see the sonship. The, the signal is Genesis 5, mm -hmm. right? If you take images, sonship, yeah. and it's a genealogy, and it's yeah. linear, so, so anyway. Yeah, yeah, that's helpful. Um, in, in, my, in my books, I've said that every human being is the image of God, but only the covenant people bear God's name. Mm -hmm. And so I use name bearing as my way of showing how it narrows down to the covenant family. But you've given me lots to think about, so thank you. Me too. We have time for a few questions, so uh, if you have them, just make sure it's a question. Uh, <laughs> and uh, yeah, just uh, move to the mic. Um, Come on, I'm, I'm sure there's, <laughs> come on. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> um, I'm curious how you would recommend we think about the intrinsic tie between male and femaleness mm. to the image, to mm. bearing mm -hmm. God's image or to being God's being image. God's image. Mm -hmm. um, and what, what happens to that in the fall if there is not a distortion or a loss mm -hmm. that would then mm -hmm. result in yeah all kinds of, yeah, stuff. Yeah, thanks, I, I cut that part out of the paper, so thank you. Um, so it's very clear in Genesis 1 that male and female are God's image and that both are told to rule. So there's, an, there's a built-in collaboration between men and women that is intended by God uh, for the flourishing of creation. And what I see happening at the fall with that um, is, is what was supposed to be a collaboration becomes asymmetrical. So now the, the woman's desire is for her husband and he will rule over her and there's this kind of jockeying for position instead of collaboration uh, side by side. And, and I'll also say that I don't think the, our, so I think it's clear that our sexed embodiment is part of what it means to be human, but I don't think that the f be fruitful and multiply is a necessary condition of being the image because Jesus is the image of God and he doesn't have any offspring, biological offspring. So this is not saying to be the image of God, you have to make babies. Um, but that is one of the features of our difference. Yeah. Quick follow-up. Sure. I should have clarified. I'm thinking more so in, in terms of the, the gender conversation, which is, mm -hmm. it's mm -hmm. dynamic in terms of whether you can either even separate that from sex, but. Um, right. I'm more so wondering how male and femaleness as sex and gender fits into your paradigm of what happens in the fall mm -hmm. that we would then have um, uh, intersex mm -hmm. people. And, mm -hmm. and so like mm -hmm. what, what could you articulate a little bit more for me, I guess, what, how you're viewing yeah. the fall on that? What I'm, uh, yeah, so I feel like there are a lot of things we would like for Genesis to tell us that it doesn't answer. And intersex is one of those questions that I don't think it answers. Um, I think when, the, when Genesis 1 and 2 is talking about man, a man and a woman who are the image of God, who are supposed to work together, it's, it's, not, defining, uh, it's not defining gender for us. And, and it's not telling us what does manhood look like and what does womanhood look like and what if somebody doesn't quite fit either category, either biologically or gen in terms of gender expression? It's not answering that. What it is saying is that humans are unlike animals and we're, we're both like and unlike each other. So there are differences and similarities between male and female. Uh, that, and that complementarity matters uh, between male and female. But I don't think it quite answers the intersex question. Okay. Uh, yeah, just a quick, two quick comments. One is, uh, a number of scholars have talked about the 
the fall in terms of its impact on the cosmos mm. and the direct, it is fascinating study, Fretheim's done some really nice work on that, so that what's happening in the fall is in affecting all the human relationships, but it's also mm. affecting biology too, mm. right? We have w barren women suddenly turning up, we have a famine, that's an ecological issue. Mm -hmm. So, uh, and, and to the other point is that there's the, Redemption is a restoration of it, and Fretheim argues that the law is a reclaiming. So I think that's the first thing. And the second thing I would just say, I probably would say more about um, what Genesis 1 says about gender as well and gender expression. I'm not saying that it's the same in every country, of course. Mm -hmm. When I arrive from Australia and I watch my first football match, I said to, I've said to people, why are they wearing shiny leotards? Mm -hmm. I mean... It felt very feminine. We, I have a brother-in-law who's a footballer too. I mean, I mean we still always see that because that, that wasn't my culture of manhood, right? Mm -hmm. So those things are culturally defined. But I do think we need to go to looking at the law as well, not seeing Genesis in isolation. What does it look mm -hmm. like for issues to do with gender? Like uh, Deuteronomy 22 about cross-dressing. What, what implication does that have for this conversation? Hi, thank Hi. you so much for sharing with us. Mm -hmm. um, this is more of an exploratory question, but I'm kind of curious how um, the dimension of um, the Imago Dei and also with the spiritual realm, specifically with angels and like the fall of the angels mm -hmm. in early Genesis, um, and then also in Deuteronomy where you have the allotment of the nations going to different angels. So you have this idea of rulership there and you also have it within the divine council, mm -hmm. but then you also have in Corinthians this idea of like humans are now judging over angels. There's this kind yeah. of flip-flop, So, but it's not nearly as clear as it is in terms of the image of God with humans in Genesis 1 and 2, so I'm just curious. Yes, I hear Michael Heiser in the room. <laughs> um, so let me just admit that I know, I know Michael Heiser says that, that angels are also the image of God that they, they Im he would use image as a verb. I don't use it as a verb, but since we're invoking him here, they image God in the spiritual realm, whereas humans image God in the physical realm. Um, I have on my to-do list to study this this year, to read everything he's written about that and to formulate a response. My initial thought on the idea of angels being the image of God is no. They don't have human bodies, and that's what it's all about. Like that's, It's about being that physical, animate representative of God uh, on earth. And I actually love, Carol, how you brought out the, um, the, the walking with them in the garden, not just representing him in all the places where he isn't. Ah. That's, that's a beautiful, yeah, that's like, just, yes, of course, of that's course. That's the line from her book that stopped me in my tracks. Yeah. Beautiful. Yeah, yeah. So... Um, I, I'm not convinced that angels are the image of God. There may be a there may be an analogy in that angels have a rulership over over the spiritual realm, and I'm on board with there being a divine council and even probably allotments of spaces to them. Uh, Michael Heiser is a lot surer about how that uh, how all that works out than I am uh, at this point. Yeah, so I, I have more to learn. Yeah. So yeah, and I'm with you with that too with some of those. Uh, how sure he is, perhaps more sure than he should be in places. <laughs> so I will say that. But I think it, it does relate to the plural pronoun, let us make man in our image. What is the antecedent to that? Some will take that as the divine counsel, and that can have implications for it. Uh, I take it more as Elohim and the spirit rather than... Hmm. So that hmm. has implications. Mm -hmm. And then he also does a lot with Genesis chapter 6, the sons of God, which yeah. I'm not fully on board with that. 